Well, welcome back to another episode of Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, I would like to say that this has become normal for me, but I don't ever want it to be normal. I miss seeing you and being together, uh, and so I just uh, appreciate your willingness to continue to engage this way. Before we get started, a couple things that I wanted to point out to you really quickly. I had an email last week with a really valid question and uh, really was encouraging to me that people were still thinking about this. And the question was, is there a way to communicate with our church as to how we are doing financially? Uh, we really haven't talked about it much. I know in First News a couple of times, uh, the guys have alluded to the fact that, that you can still give online or mail your uh, contributions in. Um, and so we really haven't reported anything. Uh, let me assure you that ministry needs still go on and dollars are still needed to make sure that that happens. Um, but we want to be sensitive also to, to the fact that we know that each of us are, are learning to live in this uh, new era and how that also impacts our, our budgets and our, our finances. And so we've been sensitive to that as well. But I did want to take an opportunity, particularly since uh, I got this email asking the question, just to let you know that, that God has been so faithful and he's been so faithful through you. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, and to, to let you know, uh, as of March, what uh, came in versus what was budgeted to come in uh, was about 85% of, of what was budgeted. So in other words, uh, what we had come in was 167000 of the 195000 that was budgeted. In April, our budgeted receipts we're projected to be 179,000, and in April so far, we've had 100, 179,000 to this point. 162,000 have come in has come in so far, and so uh, we're at 90 percent of budgeted uh, contributions. And so that speaks very highly of you and your faithfulness to make sure that ministry continues to happen uh, here, and and making sure that. Uh, that we're, we're taking care of our financial responsibilities, uh, even though the church can't gather. And so just wanted to take an opportunity to let you know where the church is. We've obviously scaled back on some of our expenses, and some of the expenses uh, just aren't there right now because we're not gathering. But at the same time, there are other expenses that we've had to take on to make sure that we can engage in this way. And so uh, nothing has really changed to the bottom line as far as the needs, but uh, just different in how we're spending that and how we're making sure we continue to do ministry and, and engage uh, with one another uh, in this time frame. So just wanted you to have that update. I hope you had a chance, and if not, go find it, but I hope you had a chance to hear our big announcement yesterday on uh, Facebook. Uh, we are getting ready to regather as a church, and so I encourage you, I'm not going to spend time here to, to rehash that, but uh, but look for that and find that big announcement. You'll be hearing more as we move towards the 10th of May. And so we're not going to gather this Sunday, but we will gather beginning on the 10th. And so look for that big announcement and be looking for other announcements uh, as we get closer to that date. I'm excited to, to get back together. Uh, and so, but we want to do so responsibly, just as, the, as we announced on the way uh, into this uh, stay-at-home order that we wanted to continue to meet as long as we could do so responsibly. Now we want to come back to gathering again, but we want to do that responsibly. Uh, and so just be, uh, be looking for those kind of things as uh, we get closer to the 10th. All right, last week we finished up chapter one of the Gospel of John, and so today I want to pick up in chapter two. And what we'll find today is a, a wonderful story. The first miracle, really what John's gospel, and we'll talk about this again momentarily, but John's gospel really uses the word sign as opposed to miracle or, or uh, any other word that you might choose to describe. But what we have here today that we'll talk about is the first sign of Jesus' Messiahship in the beginning of his, his earthly ministry. And so beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, I'm going to read you the entire story, and you'll recognize it as we start going through it. And then we'll go back and, and talk about uh, some things that I think are important to point out, some things that give us insight into Jesus and his, uh, his ministry and his relationships. 
On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial, ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, and his mother and brothers and disciples with him. There they stayed for a few days. What we find here is, is a beautiful, beautiful depiction of really what launched in, in John's depiction and John's uh, account of Jesus' ministry, what launched his earthly ministry. Uh, he had already begun to, to, to choose his disciples, to gather his disciples. To this point in following the chronology in John, we, we only have about six disciples that have, have uh, begun to follow him. We know that uh, Cana, as we discussed last week, was the home of Nathaniel, one of the disciples. And so we find that uh, there's a connection here. Um, I don't want to put too much stock or too much weight, rather, uh, in, in the chronology, but John does find it necessary to tell us that this happened on the third day. Uh, there's discussion about what that means, the third day of what, but if you follow it from uh, in context with where we've been, uh, basically it's, it's, it would suggest that this happened within the first two days of he calling his disciples, beginning to call his disciples. Uh, because we have in verse 43 of chapter 1, the next day, uh, and this would have been the day after he had been with John the Baptist and been baptized. Uh, and so if you follow that chronology, then this would be within a matter of a couple of days of him calling some of these folks. And so they end up in Galilee, end up at, in Cana at this wedding. Now, now let me just stop there for just a second. I don't want to, to go into a great a lot of detail, but when we think wedding, we have a concept because of our American ways of doing things, and, and really, honestly, over the last probably 15 years or so, 20 years maybe, uh, we've seen more of a, of a celebration attached to weddings. I will tell you, back in the day when, when I got married, when Christy and I got married, uh, the norm was you had a ceremony, you had cake and some peanuts and some punch, and then you were out the door. Uh, nowadays, there's typically a meal and a big celebration to go with it, and it's not just a, an hour, hour and a half long celebration. It's more of a three or four or five hour celebration. So things have changed a little bit, even in my lifetime. But what would have been current and what would have been common practice in a Jewish setting, in a Jewish culture, was a, more than a couple of days of a celebration. So we're talking about a, a major event uh, when when a couple got married and so it was a, a large gathering it was a, a large celebration with food and and wine and and uh, all of these things going on so we find here that Jesus and his disciples were invited along with Mary to attend this wedding celebration this event uh, and and it's some it's interesting if you really read into this text and understand the culture and, and really try to see what was happening, it's interesting that, that it points out specifically that Jesus' mother, Mary, was there. 
Well, you were invited to these events. You didn't just show up. You had, you had to be invited because of the food and all of the things that went into it. Uh, there had to be a lot of planning, months of planning uh, that went into something like this. And so Mary was invited. Mary was there. And Jesus, it points out to say, Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. Now, again, not to read too much into this, but it may make a little more sense as to why Mary feels compelled to get involved in the dilemma. But it's, there's a good chance, and, and many scholars would say, that Mary was somehow uh, connected uh, to this family that was having this wedding, either by relative or close friendship. And, of course, we talked about uh, last week the fact that Cana and Nazareth are, are fairly close in proximity, about three and a half miles. It's a good chance they knew each other. But, but John made it a point to, to, to state that Mary was invited and that Jesus and his disciples were also invited. There's a chance, possibly, given the fact if we take the chronology that this happened the third day of Jesus beginning this ministry, that uh, there's a good chance that Mary had some influence into why the disciples got invited. Now, that, again, that's just uh, speculation, I understand, but when you see the lengths to which Mary was wanting to go to get involved and inject herself uh, into this situation, uh, it almost would lend some credibility to the idea that maybe Mary was there and felt a little bit of responsibility because uh, Jesus and, had come and, and brought all his friends, basically. Uh, and so, again, not to read into it, but, but it is an interesting thought that, that Mary would have this connection with the family and, and have some responsibility here, or at least feel some responsibility here. Could be that they ran out of wine because they had more guests than they had planned on from, for a month ago. But, but again, speculation. So Mary sees what is happening. They're, they've been invited to this wedding, and when the wine is gone, in fact, the word there is failed. It just completely is done. Um, Jesus' mother, he says, John says, comes to him and tells Jesus they have no more wine. Now, granted, I, let me just pause here for just a second. I realize we're Baptists, and that may mean something totally different to us uh, traditionally, historically. Uh, but, but I really, really want to point out that, that we're not talking about grape juice because, obviously, uh, we find in the latter part of the story that the normal process would be you bring out the, the bad stuff later because after the guests have had too much to drink, they wouldn't notice the difference. So we're talking about wine here. So I don't, don't let that be a stumbling block. Don't miss the miracle. Don't miss the sign. She comes to him and she says, there's no more wine. And for us as Baptists, that may, well, okay, so what? Drink water, drink tea, you know, what, whatever. But in this culture, that would have been a huge embarrassment uh, to, to the family. And as we find out through the story, that the bridegroom was really responsible because the, the person that was managing this party pulls him aside to point out, hey, normally people would bring out the good stuff first, but you've waited till the last to bring out the good stuff. That what a what a wonderful guest or host you are. So we know that the bridegroom would have been the one that would really have been embarrassed and the family embarrassed by the fact that they ran out. And Mary's concerned about this. So she goes to Jesus and she says, hey, they, they, they've run out. And, and there's no question there. There's no uh, suggestion, hey, do something. But the insinuation is she's coming to Jesus. She knows what Jesus is capable of, I think we can see here. Why else would she come to Jesus? I don't think she would come to Jesus to say, hey, run down to the local 7-Eleven and get some more. She comes because I believe she knows what he's capable of. And so she comes and she makes this, this issue known, which would have been a big issue for, for the family. Uh, maybe not so much now, but it would have been then. It's interesting Jesus' response. He doesn't say, oh, mom, come on. He says, woman, dear woman. And it's specific there. It doesn't, the word it can't be translated mother. It is, it is woman. And, and it, it sounds a little harsh for us, maybe, but what most commentators would say, most scholars would say, is what we see here is a definite uh, line in the sand that from this point on, I'm, my ministry has begun. 
and I'm the Messiah. I'm no longer really your son. And I know as a parent how hard that is to see your children grow up and uh, begin to, to turn loose and realize that they're adults and you really can't tell them what to do anymore. And so really what we see here is that break and, and the, the definite start of Jesus as begun his ministry and, and serving as Messiah. And he says here, Dear woman, why do you involve me? Uh, another translation could be, what is it to us? Why is this important to me? My time has not yet come. Now, if you've been with us before on our Wednesday night Bible studies, I did a study of the Gospel of Mark uh, about a year, year and a half ago. And as we went through the Gospel of Mark, there are uh, uh, 16 chapters in the Gospel. And about half of them, when Jesus performs a sign, performs a miracle, he makes the statement, go and don't tell anyone. And then about halfway through the gospel, he begins to let up on trying to keep things quiet. The reason being is he knew. Jesus knew from day one where his ministry was headed. He knew that his building these relationships, teaching these disciples, teaching his followers, pouring into them, was going to lead and end up at a cross. And so he knew that he needed time to pour into his disciples, to build up a following that would carry on this gospel message after he was gone. And he knew that as, if word got out too quickly, his ministry would be cut short because he knew what was going to happen. He knew where he was going. And so that's the meaning of his statement here. My time has not yet come. But here's where I think we get a glimpse, and I think it's a beautiful picture of a son and his mom. Granted, we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Son of God. We are talking about the Messiah. But the reality is, as we've already stated within this study, Jesus was both and is both God and fully man as well. And I think we see here a picture of his humanity and his relationship with his mom. Because all she does is come and say, they've no more wine. And Jesus' response is, woman, what is that to me? It's not my time yet. And then the next thing we find in the text is Mary turns to the servants and just says, do whatever he says. I think we can see a picture here of Mary knowing she had gotten through to Jesus and Jesus was going to honor her wish, honor her desire to help out this family. Because she turns to the servants and says, all right, whatever he tells you to do, be sure and do it. And the very next thing we see is Jesus begins to give them direction. His mother said this, do whatever he tells you. And then we're told nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind that were used for ceremonial washing. Jewish custom was that uh, there was a lot of ceremonial washing, particularly before uh, any kind of meal or, or any kind of uh, a gathering like this. So Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they did. Uh, they filled them uh, to the brim. What that tells us is there wasn't any more room in these jars for anything else. It was just water. It wasn't like they put a little water in and then added some wine so that it water it down to make it go farther or however that might happen. The text is very clear that they took these jars that would hold up to 20 to 30 gallons of water and they filled them to the brim. There was no more room for anything else. And then we find that Jesus tells them to now draw some water out. Same word that's used to draw water out of a well. To draw some water out, and what we would see from that is that it's still water at that point, and take it to the master of the ceremonies, the, the person in charge, what we would call today maybe uh, the wedding planner, the wedding coordinator that's there to make sure everything happens as it should. In this culture, it was also the person that tasted everything to make sure that, that what was about to be presented to the guests was, was going to be uh, noteworthy and, and good. 
And so they take this water that has, we find now, has been turned to wine. And we don't know if it turned to the wine in, in the jug or if it was in the process, but by the time the, the uh, wedding coordinator, will say, the banquet manager got it, it was wine, and he tasted it, and immediately pulls the bridegroom aside in private and says, I don't know what you're doing here, but most people would do it just the opposite. But this, what we learned from that is this evidently was much better than what had been served prior. And so it's a compliment to, to the bridegroom. So not, not only did, did Jesus uh, save the bridegroom and the family from embarrassment, but also now has really uh, made them look even better uh, to the guests and to, certainly to this uh, banquet manager. And so we find all of that, and here we come then in verse 11 to the point. And I want to pause here to say, too, miracles in Scripture, the signs and wonders that Jesus performed were always on purpose. They always had a purpose. And most often, if not each time, they were to point to the glory of God to the fact that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And so what we have here in verse 11, this, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. What we find, I think, here in this one uh, short verse is these disciples, while just the day or two before had begun to follow Jesus as the possible Messiah, now began to see him as deity, as truly the Son of God. They had, they had placed enough trust in him as Messiah to begin to follow him. But now this head knowledge of this could be the one, this could be the one that could change the, the way that our lives operate. This could be the one to rescue the Jewish population out of Roman rule. What was in their head as a possibility of a change coming, when they see this sign, they begin to change their hearts as well. They, they begin to trust that he truly is who he says he is. We find as the story ends that the disciples, the brothers, and, and Mary and, and Jesus end up back in Capernaum for a few days. Um, I wonder if, I wonder what Mary was thinking uh, as a result of, of what happened. I have to go back to, to Luke's depiction after the, the shepherd showed up at the, the manger scene, and, and Luke tells us that Mary stored all these things and treasured them in her heart. I think now 33 years, 30 years uh, into the future from that point, how she's treasuring these things in her heart, what, what this must have meant for her. Um, but more importantly, what it meant for the disciples to really see who Jesus is, to really begin to see the difference that he can make in the world, the difference that he can make in our lives. I want to wrap up, I want to close there, but I want to wrap up with this thought. Jesus took ordinary water and he changed it into something that made a huge difference in the lives. Maybe insignificant in the grand scheme of the universe, but for that moment in the lives of those people, for that family, for that bridegroom, it made a huge difference. I don't think it's a huge leap to think about how Jesus can take our normal lives, things that would normally be a regular routine, and use those things for his glory, to point to his glory. So I want to close with that thought that maybe we see here the power that Jesus has to transform the ordinary into something that can really make a difference. Allow Jesus to transform you into something that can 
really be used by him to make a difference in those around you. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for an opportunity to gather. I thank you for your word and the way that it gives us insight into who you are, insight into how you interact with us. Uh, even tonight as we have seen uh, this depiction of Jesus and how he related uh, to his mother and his disciples, Lord, we thank you that we can see a human compassion in him. God, I thank you that, that you are the God of transformation. Jesus, I thank you that you come into our lives and you change us and transform us to be more like you. Use us this week. Use us, our normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill selves, to be used by you for your glory in the life of someone else. That's our, that's our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.